Great. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Justin, uh, who will present um, some background about uh, the MS to LDA tool. And um, afterwards, I will also talk a bit about uh, Molnet Enhancer. And yeah, I think Justin, the floor is all yours. Can you hear us, Justin? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me again? Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, uh, Madeleine. And uh, it's my pleasure to be with you, rather uh, through the internet, but uh, I hope you can all hear me well. So um, uh, the aim of this blog is to get you introduced into substructure, uh, mining, and also some chemical class annotation. And um, so I will start with some, some background and then for the more hands-on part, uh, Madame will take over. So basically it's everything around getting more out of your untargeted mass spectrometry data, right? And um, so let me, oops. so um, with my group uh, in Wageningen, uh, we, uh, we apply and we develop tools um, to do that uh, in the application areas of natural product mining and discovery and also the food metabolome. Um, but of course, these tools are more widely applicable also for the DOM example that you have this week and also environmental sciences and, and other areas where metabolomics, small molecules play a role. So if you're interested in, in, in our work, then uh, yeah, uh, we have a website where you can see which, which uh, research lines we have and also uh, keep an eye out for open positions if you're looking for, for jobs because there will some positions will be opening up in, in the course of the next academic year. So um, untargeted metabolomics as a whole is on the rise, I think uh, because of several reasons. Uh, some of them may have been already uh, discussed with you or you have seen yourself, but instrumentation got faster. Uh, we've got better generic extraction protocols and also automation plays a big role there. And you can see it also in, in publications, right? More than 1,000 publications were published last year uh, with untargeted metabolomics uh, mentioned. Um, however, I also strongly believe that it's supported by computational metabolomics because as you will have seen, uh, you can generate now a lot of data, uh, MS data, MS, MS, MS data, but how to analyze it. So, and, and there are all the computational tools uh, that came out over the last years, including MZMine, molecular networking, and others have played a, a pivotal role to, to drive and target the uh, metabolomics. But now the question is how to annotate substructures or structures based on MS, MS spectra. And, and uh, uh, so if there's one takeaway from this block, then it's this. Uh, if you look at this uh, apartment uh, in, in, in Copenhagen, um, so basically this was the view of uh, out of my window uh, when I lived in, uh, 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 during the time when I lived in Copenhagen. And uh, I liked the building, but as you can see, uh, uh, we can quickly recognize it's a house, it's a building because we can see windows, we can see particular structures like the roof, uh, and other uh, ornaments. And um, that's basically, uh, when we do better mining on this object, we can quickly recognize it's a, it's a flat, right? And uh, maybe for those of you that live in Copenhagen, you will recognize even uh, that it's, uh, it's from there, uh, based on some characteristic features. And uh, it's this aspect that we use over and over again in, 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 in different omics fields, in, including uh, metabolomics. Uh, because with better mining, we can group, we can, we can uh, start to annotate and connect things. So uh, the current format is not so uh, interactive. And some of you have seen this picture before, I'm sure. It's when I took it uh, uh, close to San Diego. And our human brain, within a few seconds, will recognize, typically, two groups, right? There's two different groups of animals. And luckily, both of them are not so dangerous to us, especially on a distance. So, and the idea behind pattern mining and using it in metabolomics is that you can exploit the grouping to propagate structural features, right? So if one bird can fly, then, well, maybe all the birds can fly, okay? 
And there's two examples of Moloker families, uh, uh, Moloker networking, and, and uh, you will you will see that in this week uh, already, uh, how you can you use that. And now today, uh, we will focus a bit more on extracting the building blocks of metablogs or the substructures, because also that we can use to group and uh, propagate features and annotate whole families. So, well, in short, how does it work? So uh, uh, the tool was coined in 2016 as MS2 LDA. So uh, the name uh, is like going from MS, mass spectrometry to LDA, uh, using uh, the, the latent derivative allocation, topic modeling. Well, let's quickly forget that again. We just focus on how it works. And also uh, MS2 is, is like using MS2 data with, MS, with LDA. So it's important to, uh, to mention this, it's untar unsupervised, uh, untargeted substructure discovery. You don't need to know what is in your sample to try to find the patterns that could be linked to particular substructures. So we're going from text to molecules. So uh, it's fired by text mining. So uh, for example, you have different documents with words and you want to quickly analyze that to see what, what they are about. Then we can try to recognize words that are often co-occurring in text because they may represent a particular topic. And as you can see on the left-hand side, we have different documents and the words are colored by their topic. Okay, and, and I hope you agree that the red words represent football-related topic and the blue words could represent a business-related topic. And then finally, the green words represent a more environment or energy-related topic. Yeah? And uh, already a few things pop up, like, hey, we can recognize different topics in one document, and we can recognize the same topic in different documents, uh, the blue topic present in the two documents. And if we think about substructures and molecules, it's exactly what we want, right? So we have molecules, they can consist of multiple substructures, but also the same substructure could be reused in different molecules. So bang on, yeah? So let's see, eh, how, how do we go to the molecular world? Well, the documents become the molecules, eh, the spectra, and the words become the fragments or the neutral losses. And then finally, eh, uh, you can see that the word club in the, on the left uh, upper corner is, is uh, mentioned like four times. And typically we can do a word count in, in, top, in, in uh, text mining. And that indicates the importance of a word for a topic. Well, in, on our end, in the mass spec world, we have we don't have words, but we have the spectra, and we can use the, the normalized densities, basically densities, as a proxy for this word count or the importance for a particular topic. And if we think about it, the higher the normalized density, also the more likely we will actually see the peak in uh, mass spectrum occurring under various conditions. Okay. So uh, back in 2016, we analyzed uh, beer and I, I saw some pictures already from, uh, from uh, leading up to the workshop. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you have seen, have you seen some beer? Uh, and so we measured some um, Scottish ales and in there I could uh, annotate based on the patterns and uh, using uh, databases already quite some biochemically relevant substances, amino acids, aromatic substructures, sugars, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we also did validation uh, using 5,000 GPS spectra, 2,000 uh, uh, mass bank spectra. And I want to uh, let you uh, know, so 5,000, that was all there was back in 2015 when we started that, that process. And nowadays, seven years later, I think we are uh, nearing the 500,000 uh, annotated spectra in GPS and uh, of roughly 22,000 unique uh, molecules. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. And I will come back to it uh, at the end of this uh, short uh, uh, primer. So actually we, we managed uh, with, with the data that was to validate quite a couple of the uh, uh, substitute patterns that were found uh, unsupervised. So in this case, uh, the peaks are related to adenine. And you can see that even though the spectra are quite different, you are still able to connect them. Yeah? And also we could identify the green loss that was related to the ribose part of, of the molecule in the middle. And together, uh, the two parts form the complete molecule of adenosine. So we could even use it to dereplicate uh, uh, one molecule completely. 
So of course, adaptation is difficult. So uh, and we should make not make our lives more difficult than needed. So uh, can we make this process more um, um, effective? So yes, and efficient. So we we call it MotiveDB a bit later, which is a database of objects detectable master motive substructures. So basically, you put in spectra, you get out a motive like this, which I got from from bacterial data. I analyze the data. I found out that this particular peaks were related to the uh, lactone ring of um, uh, actinomycin D. And uh, now it is part of this elevated motive set in MotiveDB. If you have uh, bacterial data, which you suspect that they may be related to Streptomyces or Cellulospora uh, bacteria, then it makes sense to add this motive set, this elevated motive set, because if related molecules are there, the annotated motives will be linked and it will be quicker to replicate your sample. And the nice thing is you can add both annotated motive sets, but also still add free motives to do the unsupervised subject of discovery in your own samples. So, okay, it's all nice, Justin, but, but you know, uh, does it really work? And can you really use it on experimental data? So, um, so I brought a small plant sample from the Romney CI plant family. Um, to cut the long story short, we have we have two different plates, and we wanted to know can we recognize differential chemistry? Yeah. Uh, for today, I, I will not uh, go into too much detail on that question, but there is a paper published back in 2019 by uh, Madeleine, who will follow me up, and uh, Kim and Tang, who is now in Korea, uh, leading this research group. And so if you want to know more about that, please have a look at the paper. Um, so I mainly talked about substructures so far. Uh, there's also this chemical class component of, of, of workflows. So for that, it's important to realize that over the last four or five years, uh, more and more uh, ontologies are, are being coined and used. We have classifier, we have empty classifier. And that help us to uh, annotate structures in a logical way, in coherent way. So it's important to realize that that by the use of these ontologies, uh, this, all these chemical class annotations are related to each other. Why? Because we can recognize more broad terms like lipids and lipid-like molecules in the green bit in the middle of, uh, of the lower figure. But also we can go more down in, in terms of uh, specificity to, for example, three terpenoids. Huh? So three terpenoids are part of these lipids and lipids-like molecules, but uh, they are more specific annotations. So, and then uh, uh, Molden Enhancer that was uh, uh, published uh, three years ago now by uh, uh, Malen et al. Uh, that brought it all together. At least the, the, the many of the tools that were, that were uh, out back then into uh, uh, into one at the end side escape network where you can then uh, see all the results on top of each other and 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 uh, combine the annotations into one uh, cohere hopefully coherent picture right so basically uh, we you can follow this the workflow stream going with your sample so in this case plant based samples but they could be from different origin. And then you do the multiple mining and library matching and the GPS, uh, molecular networking and MSLDA, subject discovery. Then you can add annotations from tools like uh, Dereplicator, FarQuest, uh, more discovery. Um, and, and then you can apply network annotation propagation that, that Madeleine will also uh, highlight a little bit, I think. And then uh, uh, we can run the uh, chemical class annotations uh, uh, using all those annotations. To get a high level overview in the, in the right bottom corner, but also we can focus on the more chemical details when we combine the substructure annotations. So um, uh, the reference in the plan journal is the work on the random CI data that kind of uh, was the the uh, lead up to the modern enhanced workflow. So um, did it work? Well, so this is the molecular network of the Roman CI plant family and each color represents a different chemical class. So, and we have a long list. So, and, but for those of you that work with plant data, there may be, I mean, if you, I were in the room, I would ask you to uh, raise your hand, but uh, I can do that now. So uh, you can raise your hand to yourself. 
But um, I hope that, that uh, you and also others will recognize that there's many plant-related classifications in the list, right? Flavonoid-related stuff, uh, phenolic glycosides, and triterpenoids. So that all kind of seems to work quite well for this uh, example, at least. So the automated annotations based on chemical class can help you to, uh, to, to uh, start to get a feeling for what's in your data. So, and then the deeper insights can occur when you map them the, the motors on top. So, uh, and then you can see an example here of a flavonoid trioglycoside family based on the, the chemical class annotations. But then if we look at the motives, the map motives, you can see a clear difference between the top and the bottom part. And then actually it turns out that there's one uh, uh, subfamily based on temporal and one subfamily based on the flavonoid cursive. Two, often occurring flavonoids in, in uh, plant material. And then another example is from the triterpenoids. Remember the lipid and lipid-like uh, kind of uh, class of uh, molecules. And uh, they are often conjugated in plants. And here we can see that uh, uh, this whole family contains of triterpenoids, but we can recognize uh, uh, protocatacuic acid, phenylic acid, and, and chromatic acid as Conjugation, uh, so, uh, conjugation agent for this different uh, triterpenoids very quickly now. Huh? So uh, here you can see how bringing it together can help you to more quickly uh, identify or, or get yourself, uh, you know, pointing out to the relevant or interesting uh, parts even of a family. So I thought, okay, uh, uh, you, now you've got the concept of pattern mining and then inspiration by text mining. So let me also very briefly uh, uh, point you out that uh, in my group, we are, we are continuing this, this line of, of research. Uh, so, um, and again, you can see here yeah, that in text mining, we have, have different sentences uh, where we can recognize if words mean the same thing or have a similar meaning. And if, if you're not from Italy, then I think you agree that those two sentences are roughly meaning the same thing. If you're from Italy, I'm sorry. Uh, cappuccino and, and coffee are all both contain coffee, right? So, um, and on the, on the metabolomic side, we can do the same thing, right? We can also try to identify relationships between fragments. Uh, so the word becomes the fragment or the laws again, and the sentence becomes the, the whole spectrum. And we can then try to run similar uh, algorithms as they do in, in text mining. That's called word to fact. Uh, to see if we can establish relationships. Huh? And um, we can then create uh, new um, uh, embeddings, uh, new dimensions. Uh, and here, as an example, I, I created this, right? Two new uh, ways of looking at the data, one positive affection, one hot drinks. And then we can score each word for how well, it kind of fits into that new uh, embedding, new way of looking at the data. And for example, the word uh, uh, coffee is completely, uh, gives a one in hot drinks and a zero in positive affection, but the word likes is and loves, they are uh, the opposite, right? So of course, normally you learn this stuff from a lot of text, or in our case, you learn this kind of relationships from a lot of uh, spectra, and then you get values. And uh, in the end, uh, we can then use this novel uh, uh, mass spectral embeddings to compare spectra. Again. So, and I brought one example. So uh, we can now use on, the, uh, on that uh, concept, we can do a fast and scalable analog search with SpectruVec. So uh, only a few seconds, we can mine a large library of, uh, of, of spectra for structure-related molecules. You can see two examples on the right-hand side for an, uh, a cyclic peptide and a lipid-like molecule where we did find structurally very related molecules in the database. And uh, the good news is that if you're interested in this, uh, check out the recent preprint by my group, Anik de Jonge, uh, on MSU Query that uses SpectroVac, MSU DeepScore, and other recent developments to come up with uh, one a uh, new machine learning based way of, of uh, doing library search and uh, analog search. So check it out. Um, yeah, I'm slow. I'm getting to the end of this primer. So uh, I promise you to come back to this mass spectra. So uh, basically uh, uh, all these tools that you heard about and, and, and many others 
are really depending on annotated data to be able to develop and test and validate, right? So if you are working on your project and you get a chance to share uh, your data, your annotations, your metadata with the scientific community, do it, right? Share your smiles, both in real life and, and, and from the molecules you annotate and share your spectra, right? And, and, and my group and other groups are, will be really, really uh, uh, happy, right? And, th and thankful to you. So, um, and just because I think it's important to uh, show that, that all this chemical stuff uh, can be very intriguing and maybe sexy as well, is that I, I'm also working on ways of how to uh, bring, let's say this mass spectrum balance that I, I talked about in, in the last few slides, uh, uh, more uh, to make them more understandable to students and also to fellow researchers. And this is uh, an example of how a visualization team at the Wageningen University called Wonder they developed this uh, um, visualization tool, this 3D tool to browse the embedding. And basically, each dot you see here is a spectrum from a mass spectral library from GMPS, colored according to their chemical classes that we discussed. And basically, uh, the students uh, had the chance to browse through this and then, for example, go to a particular uh, uh, place in the embedding and check, hey, here I see that most dots are, are white. So basically, uh, the embedding was able to group uh, structures similar molecules in one place. And then, of course, it's interesting to start to find out what kind of molecules are they and are they indeed uh, structurally related and how are they related? Are they maybe measured also on the same instrument, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if, if you're interested in all of this and more, uh, then, uh, uh, and it went a bit quick, which I can imagine, then there is a good review, I think, but I'm a bit biased uh, because I'm one of the authors uh, on, on all of this and more. So on substance annotation, class annotation and network analysis, uh, and really how we can go to large-scale substructure-based uh, analysis. So, uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, the reference is, uh, is also on the, on the slide. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, if you're interested in, in my work and in my group's work and in pictures of Wageningen and, uh, and, and the environment, then uh, follow me uh, and or my group on Twitter. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to be in touch with you and if you have additional questions. So I will stick around till the end of this block. So, uh, well, thanks a lot. And uh, the floor is yours, uh, Marlon. I think I will stop sharing. Uh, thanks a lot, Justin, for this really inspiring talk. Uh, it's really impressive how, how many tools you are developing. Unfortunately, we won't be able to show all of them hands-on at, at the workshop, but we will be looking into um, uh, MS-12 day job submission through GNPS in a minute. But first, um, of all, are there any questions to Justin's talk? From, from here, live in Tübingen, or maybe from the chat as well, I will have to look. I just wanted to add that uh, I uploaded the slides to your Google Drive on, on the Wednesday, so in case you want to look back to them. Really great, that, that's really appreciated. Um, I think there, yes, there is one question. We just heard a talk about series, but they also talked about substructures, linking to fragments, and, but it, I guess, to me, the first thing it sounds like you're doing something similar, but using a totally different kind of algorithm behind it. Is that right? So the, would it, would, if I have data, would you suggest try both? Because one well, well, will have this case, the other one will have this there. Or are there special use cases where you say, rather use this one or rather use this case, depending on what you kind of data you have? Right, I, I will just quickly repeat the question for you, Justin. Um, I will summarize, I hope that's okay. Um, so we had just a talk from Kai about serious CSI thinner ID, um, where Kai also talked about substructures. So the question is, how does MS2 LDA compare to serious CSI thinner ID? And would you suggest if you have your own data set trying both, or what's the advantage of one uh, versus the other? Um, I can quickly add, like, I will a bit go into that as well when, when I will introduce Molnet Enhancer. Yeah, so, um, well, very brief answer will be that, that if you have the time, then for sure try both and see what kind of information you can get out. Uh, um, so um, 
And then you talk about substructures. I mean, uh, uh, it's not really well defined. Eh? So, um, but what I think, eh, uh, so the patterns that MS2A picks up can be anything from a carboxylic acid group to, uh, to a minor acid to, uh, to a larger scaffold like camphorol or quercetin. Eh? Um, so, um, and uh, uh, the, the serious finger ID workflow, uh, of course, uh, um, there uh, uh, it, it will also annotate the molecules. It will uh, it, it works with fingerprints as well, and the fingerprints can also represent uh, particular functional groups or, or substructures. So, um, uh, I mean, the approach is different, but in the end, uh, the information you can get out will partly the same. Yeah. So um, I think the um, uh, an advantage of, of, of the MSLA motive to be workflow could be that you can uh, uh, pick out the relevant motive sets that are, that have annotated uh, substructures that you that you recognize as being relevant, so you can quickly uh, see uh, screen your data for them. Um, but of course, uh, a serious uh, finger ID has the advantage that uh, it it is uh, the state of the art workflow to get to uh, elemental formulas uh, for for. Uh, uh, for most of your uh, metabolites, especially the, the smaller ones, and also uh, uh, save the art in terms of uh, of the the correct candidate. So uh, if, if you can if you can use that information also as part of more enhancer, then then I would certainly do that. Perfect. Thanks, Justin. Uh, any more questions right and now? Kai, if you are around there, then feel free to uh, to add or to uh, counteract. Relevant. So I think uh, the main between both methods is uh, MSU ADA is axe-provised and CSI is provised. So these axe-provised methods are trained on all the data outside and provised methods are, tra are trained basically on specializes. And I think the consequence of that might be that uh, so the MSU ADA is really nice for inspecting the data. So I'm analyzing the data on the network because Motives might correspond to really large uh, elements. Or, like, I mean, we show a lot of examples. And I think the CSI patterns are often more, more hundred groups and stuff, which are well defined in specialities. If you can learn from specialities, my mass motives would be all the stuff which is from contains and guidance, but maybe you need your data set, and which then shows you gates, then compounds in a data set, share something in common. And that's probably something. Thanks, Kai. I'm not sure if the online participants could hear, but uh, I'm sure you can contact Kai uh, later on as well if, if you want some more in-depth um, explanation. Um, so I think I will continue with um, uh, showing you how to do the, the job, most, uh, job submission of MS2 LDA um, uh, online on GNPS. Um, Justin, I know you have to run for another meeting, so, but just feel free to leave any time you have to go. And if you're still here, feel free to chime in any time if I'm doing any mistakes or showing something wrong. Uh, just please, yes, uh, shout out. Um, but yes, so um, you can run MS2 LDA from within uh, GNPS. And so how to do is this is um, in fact really straightforward. So, I just have to get rid of this thing. Okay. Well, I'm not sure in, in whose uh, account I'm in, but it should work. <laughs> I can't log out because of the tab. But so basically, um, if you go, you can either um, go to the feature-based molecular networking job you submitted yesterday of your own uh, DOME uh, lab, interlab study data, or you can also use the link um, that's provided in the slides um, in, in the Wednesday uh, session. Um, and uh, we just select the job here. And basically what you will do is um, you go down here uh, where it says analyze with MS2 LDA. So if you click on this. Sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, of course. Sorry. I forgot that. 
Is this working now? Okay, great. Okay, so we are here. Um, GNPS automatically redirected us to the MS2 LDA um, job submission. So the first thing you can do is you can uh, give your analysis a, a title here. It's, it's really just a title of your choice. So we can say um, Dome Interlab. Uh, study and then um, MS to LDA. And um, here, um, GNPS will automatically populate everything you need. So um, you know you don't need to do anything um, here. Just to explain, um, GNPS will uh, put the MGF file that you produced within MZ Mine, um, and then also the the CSV quantification file and here you just specify that your output format is derived from um, emitted mine pre-processing. Then there are some um, specific MS2 LDA parameters you need to set. Um, usually the defaults are, are just fine. So the bin width um, is instrument dependent. So if you have QX active data, which I think is mostly the case, right? Correct me if my, I'm wrong, Daniel. Um, for for the interlap studies are mostly QX active, so you can leave that um, at the 0 0.005 bin width. Then the number of LDA iterations um, is just how many times LDA will iterate, so it's 1000 to the default is also fine. Um, then the minimum MS2 intensity um, 100 is also a good value for QX active data. Um, if you have tough data, you could consider to go down to 100. And this one uh, is basically the most important par parameter, the LDA free motifs um, parameter. So here you define um, how many motifs you expect in your data sets. And uh, this again is extremely data set dependent. So um, you might have to try out different uh, settings until you get uh, a, good, uh, a good number of, of motifs. But the data sets I usually work with, I always will estimate around 200 to 300 uh, motifs but it really depends also how rich your spectra are, so how many peaks you find in your spectrum. Um, and then um, Justin introduced, there is also the motif uh, database. So this is basically what you define down here. Um, so there is different uh, motif databases where you have um, annotated motifs. And here uh, you would of course uh, select the motif databases that you would intuitively expect uh, in your data set. So we have here a Euphorbia and Ramnacea plant um, motif databases, which of course we don't intuitively would expect in environmental samples, so in dome samples. So I would exclude those for sure. And also streptomyces and salinospores. I'm not a microbiologist, but I think I wouldn't expect them either in, in dome samples or also Photoraptus or Xenoraptus. Um, maybe if someone knows better, uh, please correct me, but I, I, I excluded them um, for, for this one. Um, and then um, I left in the GNPS motifs, which are more general uh, motifs um, from the GNPS uh, libraries. Also the mass bank is more general motifs. And I also left in the urine motifs. Um, we are not looking at urine data, but who knows, maybe there could be something in there in the <laughs> dome samples, I don't know. Um, but yes, here, this is, of course, very dependent. Uh, what, what do you think your data set contains? And so if you hover over um, those uh, motif databases, you can see how much motifs um, those uh, contain. So um, the free motifs, um, it, basically those, this number will add up to the free motifs. So if you already have 300 motifs defined here and you include all of those, I think each of those contains around 100 motifs as well. You would uh, estimate that or there are 500 motifs in your data set. So that's in my experience a bit, a bit high. So I would lower to the free, would say 100 free uh, motifs and then around 100 of these three um, motif databases. So 
it's about 300 free motifs estimated altogether. Um, and then there is some scores that you define. Usually the default is just fine. Um, if you have more specific questions or want to play more with it, um, you can also do that on the um, overlap on the sorry on the MS2LDA org uh, website. We won't go into that um, in this uh, in in this workshop, but there is a lot of material online as well that you can explore. Um, but basically, the overlap score. Um, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it defines how much um, of the mass to motif is in the spectrum, um, whereas the probability score um, would uh, define um, uh, how much, how what proportion of the um, the spectrum is explained uh, by the motif. And then the top X in node uh, is. Uh, how many motifs you in the end want to map onto your um, GNPS network. So in fact, uh, we will, in addition to the cosine uh, connections in your network, you will have uh, other lines um, that will be the motif. So the motifs will be directly mapped onto your network. And then here, um, this is Daniel's account. So it's automatically um, populates with his email address and it will be do the same um, if you, submit it uh, within your account. And then we just uh, press submit here. Yeah, so Melanie, uh, yes. I think you explained very well. So it's just that um, it's good to realize that ms uh, is a ba uh, Bayesian approach. So ba basically everything has um, a probability to belong to everything, right? So sometimes, but sometimes these probabilities are really low. So the, the, the reason that we use some cutoffs on the probability is to get rid of all the very, well, unlikely links, basically. And the overlap score was introduced to also remove uh, uh, the occasions where the algorithm, the algorithm is each spectrum has to belong to one uh, motive, but sometimes that's simply not the case. And then still they get included. So basically this overlap score helps to get rid of uh, you know, uh, such perilous kind of links that are not not real. So you can play around with the exact value. The higher you put these things, the 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 less populated the motives become, but the more real links you will also uh, throw away. Right. Thanks, Justin. Um, so yes, this was the to the MS2 LDA. Uh, we are short on time, so I will continue here um, with also Molnet Enhancer. Um, how can I access the full screen here? Daniel, do you, can, do you know? F5. F5, okay. Okay, yes. Ah, okay, thanks. Great. Also, the online people can see the slides. Yeah. Okay, we went through this the MSTLD job solution. Okay, yes, so now to Molnet Enhancer. So um, I think I, I didn't uh, introduce myself properly yet. So I'm Madeline um, and um, I, I'm currently based in Copenhagen. We have a clinical metabolomics um, lab and we'll be introducing a bit more about our work uh, tomorrow as well at, at the staff session. Um, but so what I'll be showing uh, right now here is uh, the MOLED Enhancer workflow. And this is a workflow um, I designed uh, together with uh, Justin and collaborators um, during my postdoc at Peter Dorstein's lab. So this is all uh, work um, from the past basically. So, <clears throat> um, the, the overall idea of um, MOLED Enhancer um, uh, is, is the following. So um, maybe you now, as at, in, at the workshop as well, you ran a molecular networking job. Um, maybe you also did some in silico structure annotation, maybe you used uh, as Kai showed today, CSI finger ID, or any other in silico tool that's available out there. And also then, as we just submitted the job as well, you did, uh, some substructure discovery using MS2LDA. 
And uh, you might wonder, all of these, they come in different formats and they are, the results are on different websites. And it's, it's really not trivial on how you combine this huge lot uh, of data into something uh, easier to digest and something is more easily interpretable. And so the idea of Mullet and Hatcher was really um, that we wanted to integrate uh, those different uh, outputs into one network and a, a bit more easier, uh, understandable and interpretable uh, format uh, for the end user. And uh, so how did we do that? Uh, so basically, um, what we did is we collected all the structures that we found using any in silico structure tool, um, as well as the GNPS library matches. Um, and uh, we submit them to automated chemical classification. Uh, so the, the classifier tool that Kai also showed today. And um, then we created a kind of a summary on the network um, that uh, will highlight which was the most predominant chemical, chemical class that was found by in silico and GNPS library hits um, within a molecular family. Um, but at the same time, we then also mapped the MS2LDA motifs within the network so that we would also get some more uh, subtle substructural differences um, of, of, of our um, chemical data. Um, and so a bit more detail on, on how the uh, how how this is done or how we designed uh, this algorithm. And um, so basically, um, uh, all those structures um, the, that you retrieve from in silico structure annotation or GMPS, um, they will be uh, summarized into chemical classes on to the network. Um, so you can highlight them at different uh, chemical class levels. Um, and the way that it's uh, done is through classifier. Um, so basically it's, it's a tool where you submit uh, SMILES structures and classifier will uh, give you um, this chemical classifications in a, in a, so there's different hierarchical levels, uh, chemical ontology basically that also Kai, um, I think already nicely introduced. Um, and then so on the network, um, we will explore, so we get different matches, right, per mass spectra. So we have always a, a, a lot of different chemical structures per node. And uh, we, or Molet Enhancer, we look at those structures and uh, classify all of them and saying like, some are flavonoids, so some are coumarins and so on. And then uh, we will calculate which would be the most predominant class in this molecular family. And here we see, so most nodes are green. So we would say 2.25, um, of the nodes in this molecular family out of six nodes um, are flavonoids. So the molnet enhancer uh, tool would retrieve for you 37% um, or most uh, molecules of, of this um, molecular family um, are classified as flavonoids. Um, so I think here it's very important to see that um, it's just providing you a summary data. So it's by far not uh, comparable with, with a very sophisticated algorithm that uh, Kai talked about with predicting actual chemical classes, but it's more to guide your manual structural annotation and to give you a bit of a, a hint where you could look for. So it's, it's not the absolute class that that's true, it's just a, a hint basically. Um, and so this uh, most predominant chemical classes, they will are calculated at all levels of the classifier ontology. Um, and what you get back is what Justin also showed uh, a bit in his slides already is like these uh, colorful networks where you can highlight uh, different classes. Um, and um, as we know through um, library matches, uh, we can only about retrieve two to five percent of our data with chemical structures and in this way, um, by using a tool like Mullet Enhancer, you can enhance um, this chemical structure annotation to about 40%, um, meaning not annotated, but at least you might get an idea of more broad um, chemical classes that are found in your, in your data. 
Um, I think very important is to highlight here that uh, don't trust uh, those classes. It's really just something that can guide your manual structure annotation. So these classes don't necessarily show the truth. Um, they are just, as I showed, a summary of the most predominant chemical classes that have been retrieved through um, the in silico tool of your choice and through the Genius Library matches. And uh, just to give you a bit an idea of, of what I mean by that and how you can interpret such uh, a network, if, if you cannot trust it, how, how do you interpret it then? Um, so I brought a little example that's from uh, lab uh, 15 from the dome samples that we're working at. And we have here a little uh, molecular family um, where with different masses and um, GNPS didn't retrieve any structural hit for us. Um, so, okay, what, what do we do now? Basically, we know nothing about those features. Um, but so if we um, run an in silico tool, and here I chose to run a network annotation propagation, which is based on Metfrag. I will uh, say some words about that as well. But so it's just an alternative to serial CSI thing, right? Basically. Um, and what, what we get then is this myriad of structures. Um, but um, how do we know which one is the correct structure? And even is there something that's meaningful to us? Um, so what Molnet Enhancer can provide is, um, it would in this case tell us that a majority of compounds that were predicted by in silico structure annotation um, are organohydrocyclic uh, compounds. Um, and uh, so we already get an idea, okay, it's probably something, yeah, a lot of things can be organohydrocyclic compounds, but um, we get a bit an idea of what kind of compounds it could be. Um, and then um, we can, in addition, also map uh, the motifs. And in this case, uh, we see that all of these structures to share uh, a master motif, which was annotated as a, a urine master motif 64. So it's a C6H9NO3 substructure. And then in our in silico structures, we can try to see are there any structures that actually contain this substructure? And we can see that two of those structures actually have the C6H9NO3 substructure. So this is just how you can combine different tools to get uh, a bit more confidence in your um, structural annotations. Um, again, as Kai said, most likely it's not the exact structure, but at least you get an idea what sort of compounds that could be. Um, so here you could maybe conclude that um, those compounds could be organohydrocyclic compounds and maybe they are tetrapeptide, tetrapeptides um, which contain the C6H9NO3 substructures, which, which would be something really uh, typical or common in a tetrapeptide. Um, and so uh, this would correspond in the metabolite identific identification levels to a two to three level identification. Um, again, it's not the exact structure that you will get, but I think it's much better than uh, really knowing nothing uh, about, about the structures as um, per se you would by just uh, using the GNPS um, network. Uh, yes, and also a uh, Molnet Enhancer, you can run it uh, directly uh, within GNPS. Um, we will, if we have time, I think we do, um, we will go through this as well. Um, but uh, before we run this, we also need to do um, an in silico structure prediction. And the way Molnet Enhancer is set up on uh, GNPS right now, um, it accepts um, in silico structure input uh, from uh, not a serial CSI finger ID in that case, but a network annotation propagation. And so before we can start Molnet Enhancer, we also need to uh, run an in silico structure annotation through network annotation propagation. And just to say a very few words about this algorithm, um, so basically uh, network annotation propagation is uh, based on the algorithm that's called METFRAC that uh, Kai also mentioned, and uh, it uses uh, structures from databases as input and then tries to predict a, um, a mass spectrum. And those mass spectrum are then matched to your um, library 
to your uh, experimental spectrum spectra. And so what network annotation propagation does is it then re-ranks those candidates based on the network. Um, and it does that uh, assuming that the library matches are, um, are sort of the ground truth, so the most correct matches, so to say. So if you imagine you have one molecular family here, um, the red ones would be the MSMS um, library matches, and the blue ones would be in silico matches. So you can imagine if you have these three structures predicted um, in silico, it will compare those um, to what uh, you retrieved from the MSMS library matches, for example, on GNPS, and then will it will re-rank uh, your in silico structures based on the most similar structures to the GNPS library match. So in this case, it would be this um, hexagon um, that would be ranked as number one because it's most similar to the neighboring um, uh, MSMS library match. Okay. And so network annotation propagation um, is, you can use that um, uh, through GNPS as well. Um, and we can together now uh, see how you will do this. Um, also, this is all the steps you need to do that are on the slides that are available for you in, in the folder. Uh, so don't worry if you cannot follow um, in, in the pace right now. Um, so we go again to the GNPS website. And then you scroll all the way down um, to um, in silico tools here under advanced analysis tools. Select browse tools, and then you see here network annotation propagation, and a little blue here um, where you click on. And then it will open up uh, the network annotation propagation um, job submission website. So um, again, you can name your job submission. We just name it uh, Interlab Dome, and then we say NAP. And then here, the most important parameter here is, of course, your GNPS job ID. So we can go back to your jobs. And let's say you are you want to do NAP of uh, this uh, feature-based molecular networking job, then your job ID can typically be found up here um, in in the address. So you can copy this and insert here. And then um, the number of a cluster index, um, you can either select uh, the ID of one node from where you want to start the network annotation propagation, or you can set it to zero, which is kind of a hack. Uh, it means that it will do network annotation propagation for your whole uh, network. And um, so here you can leave that at zero. Um, and then, um, and first candidates for consensus score is just which how many candidates it will take for calculating uh, this re-ranking score. So leaving it at default is fine. Then um, the exact mass, of course, uh, depends on your instrument again as well, how much PPM error you expect. Um, and uh, then acquisition mode is, of course, for us positive and in most cases positive. And then here, structured databases. Um, basically, you enter from which structural databases and the algorithm should take uh, the SMILE structures to predict the mass spectra. Um, so here, um, if you don't have any specific idea of, of what structures you will find, um, you can just use um, all, all, of the, all of the databases. So you would just type here uh, DNPS and coconut. Um, HMDB, and so on. So you can, for your job, you can uh, select all, all the databases. Um, 
And then the rest you can pretty much uh, leave on default. The adduct ion type, you have the choice to select different adducts if you expect any special types of adducts from your experiments. Um, typically, I just leave it on M plus H, which is the most common one. Um, and then the cosine value uh, to be subselect inside a cluster, um, you can leave it at 0 0.5. Um, the important thing here is that it's lower than the cosine score you selected to create your networks, because that it will base uh, this, this cosine score, it will um, be looking at the neighbors. So um, if you set it higher, it will, will not see the neighbors um, that are actually connected in your network, if, if that makes sense. And then again, your email, um, and that's it. So here we can submit. And so this typically takes a while um, to run. Um, so in the meantime, I can show you um, how to run a MOLNET enhancer job. Um, so for the MOLNET enhancer job, you just again go to your feature-based molecular networking job. And here you have a handy link as well again, which says enhance with MOLNET enhancer. And again, you give it a title. And then there is no parameters you need to set here. Uh, the only thing is that you need is the GNPS task ID, which it already automatically pre-populates for you. And then also the NAP ID, um, which is from the job we just submitted. Um, you need to wait until it, it's finished, but just for the purpose of demonstration, um, I copy it in here. So you would copy this uh, job ID from the NAP job and fill it in here. And then also, um, if you use other um, in silico tools that are in, implemented within GNPS, such as the replicator or WarQuest, um, this is more for peptidic uh, natural products, and we won't cover it in the workshop, but there is also a lot of online material if you're interested. And um, you could also provide those job IDs here. Um, then the MS2 LDA, the LDA job ID, unfortunately, doesn't work. Um, so just don't, don't use this parameter here. Um, but you can combine the outputs manually um, afterwards with inside escape. Um, we won't have time to um, look at this uh, right now, but maybe there will be some time um, left afterwards when, when Daniel shows um, how you analyze your data with Cytoscape. Um, otherwise, there's also slides um, that I shared with you where you can uh, look at step-by-step uh, -step how, how you create um, the, the MOLED Enhancer integrated network. Um, but here we can just click Submit. And then uh, just as a little uh, teaser on how that looks like in the end. Um, I have here the integrated network already. So what you will see then in your integrated network is um, Your chemical classes, you can highlight uh, different levels of, of chemical class. So here it's the super class, but you can also do um, the, let's say, subclass, um, color them differently. And so you can highlight them in your network and also if you zoom in, you can see that uh, the different motifs um, are also highlighted um, with different colors here. So you can uh, use this information in addition to, to the DNPS network um, to help your chemical structure annotation. Um, yes, and this was already um, the end of, of this part, I think we made it pretty much in time.
Um, I put some more resources and documentation for you um, and uh, in, in the slides, um, and also all links to all the GNPS um, uh, network shops that are already done. So if you do it on your own um, data, you, you will have to wait probably until tomorrow, until those jobs um, are run. They take quite a long time. But if you want to explore beforehand, you can use those links that are provided here. And then also on the supplementary slides, I explain um, how you integrate all of those results um, within Cytoscape. Um, yeah, there will be some time for you to work on, on your data um, afterwards. And yeah, feel free to ask me anytime or yeah, also write emails if, if you encounter any issues. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions right now already? Yes. Um, you say that you can um, run the GNPS topic of the web sensor without the uh, NAND. That's true, so yes. It's like less accurate or just don't do it? It's I, I mean, you, you can do it if you have. Um, let me show that slide again. Um, So here, um, basically, I think because it creates a summary, um, it makes most sense if you have a lot of structures in your molecular family. If, if you only look at GNP's library hits, it's likely that for many molecular families, you either won't have no hit at all, or maybe one or two hits. And so the, the summary data it will provide you will be like, I don't know, one out of 20 nodes is this chemical class. So it's unless this, hit is super accurate and all of, of the nodes that are connected to it, it could make sense. But otherwise, yeah, it, it's the best is if you have as many structures as possible. Hmm. Yes, any more questions? Yes. Well, I, it, it comes to me that if I, if I ran it and I use an error system. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, oh, sure. Yes, I can come to you and, and we can find out. I will come to you right, right after. Then maybe we have some online. No, I don't think we have online questions. Yes. Yeah, there is one. No. Okay, I can have a look, and maybe it's a problem for everyone, then I will show again on the screen. So I just wanted to uh, show two things that I think were the main issues when, when the job failed for a network annotation propagation. Um, so, yes. Sorry, forgot to share the screen for the online participants. So now that should be working. Um, so I just go to my NAP job um, again. So one thing um, that's a bit tricky if, if you work with uh, NAP is that it's run uh, not on the GNPS uh, uh, interface, but on the Proteomics 2 interface. So if you actually open your job here again, you would get this notice, uh, could not find results, use specification for workflow. Um, but if you just change in your browser the address, you replace GNPS with uh, Proteomics 2 and hit enter, then you will be guided to the, to the right uh, website. Um, so actually one of the problems that, that occurred when submitting an NAP job is that here I'm already logged in right now. Um, but if, if you're not logged in, you need to log in yourself um, again up here. And it's exactly the same username and password um, as for your GNPS account. It just, it's two different platforms. So it requires you to log in again. Um, otherwise the, the job won't run. Um, okay. So I'm logging in again.
And then there was another issue that we observed, which is, is my mistake. I didn't specify that. But here for the workflow type, you actually need to select uh, MZ mine. Um, so it just specifies mm -hmm. that the data format, um, your, your feature-based molecular networking job is from an MZ mine pre-processing output. That, that's something the algorithm needs to know. And then uh, everything should, should hopefully work. Uh, were there any other issues that popped up that we haven't discussed maybe yet? Yes. The molnet enhancer. Yes. Yeah. So basically, here you can just uh, submit. So this will run your um, network annotation propagation. Uh, so if you're working with your own data, you actually need to wait until this job is finished, which will take several hours. So probably you will have to run Molnet Enhancer on your own data tomorrow. Um, but just to show you how, how you then do it. Um, so again, you go to your, um, to the feature-based molecular networking job. I have the link somewhere here. So this is just from, from our example data. Copy it. So this can be the link um, to your own data set that you processed yesterday on GNPS. And then you go to enhance with Molnet Enhancer. And then here there's very few things you need to specify. So the GNPS ID is already pre-populated. And then here you would enter um, the network annotation propagation ID. So the NAP job you just started to run. The ID can typically be found up here in the address. So you copy this and, and fill it in here. And then you basically just uh, click submit. Um, but yeah, you need to wait until NAP is finished. And the same is true for MS2LDA. If, if you want to run MS2LDA, you also go to your feature-based molecular networking job, and then you select analyze with MS2LDA. Yes. Sorry, I had troubles. Yes. If sorry, what's the question? If it's not finished, then. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. I never tried. <laughs> Yes, then I think that's it for now, unless there is more questions, but feel free to ask also later if something more pops up. Then I think we can continue with the cytoscape.